Elon Musk wants to build a colony on Mars. Whatever you think about the man, at least he gives us something to talk about. Musk thinks colonizing Mars is essential to guarantee a safe future for the human species. But his plans are hugely controversial. Many scientists have said it's too dangerous and distracts from problems on our own planet. And that's probably right, but let's be honest, dangerous distraction sounds very, very interesting. I found it hard to make up my mind about the merits of colonizing Mars, and rather than sitting on it alone, I thought we could look at both sides of the argument together. First things first, what does Musk actually want? He's planning to mass transport volunteers to Mars and build a city there with about 1 million inhabitants. With his company SpaceX, he wants to bring the costs of spaceships down so that the trip is affordable to anyone. Such a Mars colony, Musk says, is necessary for the future of consciousness, just in case that goes out of style on Earth. How many people do you need for a self-sustaining city is about a million and several million tons of cargo. Yeah, which we can do and we can do this in 20 years. At that point, the future of consciousness is assured. If you do 10 launches a day at 200 tons per launch, so roughly every two years, thousands of ships would depart from Earth to Mars. And we want to get the, we want to get the cost of going to Mars such that almost anyone could afford it. Like if somebody were to just work hard on Earth, save up, and that they'd be able to go to Mars. So it's like anyone, ideally, almost anyone could go to Mars. And I think you'll see a lot of governments also sponsor people. So we're actually going to do this. We're going to take humanity to Mars. And I'm confident you can do it. Richard Dawkins is a fan. I'm a great believer in human ingenuity, and um, I'm a, a great fan of Elon Musk, who wants to colonize Mars. And, and I think that the the greening of Mars is actually a, a possibility, a, 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 a serious practical uh, possibility. But not everyone is enthusiastic about Elon Musk's plans. A lot of critics say that we should first sort out the problems on our own planet, like, for example, Martin Rees. Uh, you mentioned Musk. Uh, he has indicated that humans could live in uh, the moon of Mars I think the point you made is that space travel will not sort out the problems that we have on Earth. Yes, I mean, I disagree with him on that. I, uh, I think there might be a few crazy pioneers living on Mars, just like there are people living at the South Pole, although it's far less hospitable than the South Pole. Um, but the idea of mass migration to avoid the Earth's problems, which he and a few other space enthusiasts adopt, that I think is a dangerous delusion. I don't think it's realistic, and we've got to solve those problems here on Earth. I like that term, dangerous illusion. It sounds like the name of a Vegas magic act. Next up, the amazing Elon Musk, who will make a trillion dollars disappear. Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Maher also think that Musk's Mars plans are at best worth a laugh. How soon could Elon Musk realistically send humans to Mars? Oh, another good question. I have strong views on that. Uh, my read of the history of space exploration is such that we do big expensive things only when it's geopolitically expedient, such as we feel threatened by an enemy. And so for him to just say, let's go to Mars because it's the next thing to do, what does that venture capitalist meeting look like? So Elon, what do you want to do? I want to go to Mars. How much will it cost? A trillion dollars. Is it safe? No, people will probably die. What's the return on the investment? Nothing. That's a five-minute meeting, and it doesn't happen. <laughs> so, so we agree. The point is, you can't live on Mars. I I've said this so many times. How badly would, would we have, how badly would we have to rat fuck Earth yeah. before it was worse than a place that's 200 below zero? Yeah, yeah. With no air, I'm with no you. Oh, water, <laughs> with with six months. Preach it, preach it. <laughs> you too. But many scientists on Twitter were quite disappointed about this exchange, especially about Neil's take on the idea of going to Mars. It's depressing that our most famous science popularizer, who also happens to be an astrophysicist, cannot muster excitement and enthusiasm over potentially going to Mars, writes Colin Wright. And Musk's own reply to the degrasse Maha discussion was, wow, they really don't get it. Mars is critical to the long-term survival
survival of consciousness. Also, I'm not going to ask any venture capitalists for money. I realize that it makes no sense as an investment. That's why I'm gathering resources. Okay, I think you get the picture. They can't agree on whether it's worth doing. So let's have a look at the how and why, starting with some background facts. Mars is our next neighbor planet and among the planets in our solar system, the one that's most similar to Earth. It's about 100 million kilometers farther away from the Sun than we are, has about a tenth of the mass and a third of the gravitational pull. Mars has an atmosphere, but it's very thin and unbreathable for us. It contains basically no oxygen and is mostly carbon dioxide and nitrogen. The larger distance from the Sun and lack of a warm warming atmosphere makes Mars very cold. The average temperature is just about minus 60 degrees Celsius or minus 80 Fahrenheit. We know that there is water on Mars, a lot of it in the form of ice on the poles, but still seeing the low temperatures, lack of sunlight and atmosphere, it's clear that living on Mars would be very difficult, not to mention unpleasant. Scientists have put forward a lot of plans to terraform Mars to make it more Earth-like by giving it a breathable atmosphere and warming it up and growing plants there. I've talked about this several times before and the brief summary is that these plants are unfeasible in the near future just because of the enormously large scale involved. It'd require moving and handling enormous amounts of materials and is way beyond the economic capacity that humans currently have on Earth, let alone on another planet. Just to give you a sense of the problem, the reason Mars doesn't have an atmosphere is that it's been ripped away by solar wind that are charged particles which constantly blow out of the sun. The reason that this happened on Mars and not on Earth is that Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. This is also why the radiation dose on the surface of Mars is rather unhealthy. So really the first thing you'd need to do to terraform Mars is to give it a magnetic field. Otherwise any new atmosphere will just drift off into space again. The most realistic plan I've seen for this, if you can call it that, is to run electric currents through superconducting wires around Mars. Leaving aside the question of how to power them, they'd have to be more than 3,000 kilometers long. I hope you see why I say this isn't going to happen anytime soon. Basically, this means that for at least the next few hundred, if not thousand years, people on Mars would be living in enclosed shelters. Then, of course, there's the danger of the flight to Mars. Mars itself. With current propulsion systems, it'd take about seven to nine months to get there. While people have been on the International Space Station for longer, in an emergency, a shuttle can be sent there on a trip to Mars. And during the entire stay, the new Martians will be 100% dependent on technology functioning properly. And it's almost guaranteed that some of them will die in novel ways. Okay, so now let's talk about the pros and cons, starting with the question of whether it's scientifically interesting. If you want to study Mars for its geology or history or early traces of life, not only do you not need people there, you might actually not want them there because they'll be trampling all over the place. For scientific purposes, it makes much more sense to send robots. Settling on Mars would be very interesting for social and psychological studies, but I can see why planetary astrophysicists may not be super excited about the prospect of having Elon move in on Mars. To be honest, I think that scientists might actually feel a bit ignored or overlooked, insulted even, that some rich guy is trying to take what were so far basically theirs, if not legally, then practically. What about economic benefits? Well, as Musk himself admitted, there's no expected return on investment. It's arguably going to drive the development of certain technologies like these habitats to begin with. But in terms of resources, there isn't all that much on Mars that you could sell. Neil deGrasse Tyson, to my understanding, basically thinks Musk doesn't have enough money to pull it off. He'll need governmental support. Here's my point. The history of really expensive things ever happening in civilization has in essentially every case been led geopolitically by nations. 
how would Elon get to send his rockets to Mars? From the, the, the playbook of the history of, ge of geopolitics. What'll happen? The United States decides we need to send astronauts to Mars one day, geopolitically, by whatever force is operating on us. And then NASA looks around and says, oh, you know, we don't have a rocket to do that. And then Elon says, I have a rocket, and rolls out his rocket to Mars. Then we ride a SpaceX rocket to Mars. I think that's probably right, and it's why Elon has been making friends in the US government. To add to Neil's point, I think Elon is way too optimistic about the number of people who might volunteer to move to Mars. Leaving aside some crazy people who'd do anything for Elon, you'd have to offer a lot of money to get someone to move to Mars, and most likely they'd still only do it for a limited amount of time. I mean, you can make $15,000 by moving to the city of Topeka in Kansas, which maybe doesn't have much to offer, but at least you don't suffocate if you step in front of the door. And if you want to spend your days wondering, why am I here? Maybe Kansas is good enough. So I tend to think that Neil is right. Even the richest man in the world doesn't have enough money to pull this off. Then again, Elon's got friends and just because I think it's not going to work doesn't mean I think he shouldn't try. Let's then talk a bit about Elon Musk's motivation for doing this. He seems to be very concerned with the future of humanity and the future of consciousness. Indeed, he said that his plan is to make sure our civilization lasts at least a million years. I mean, I'd say, like, we should think, like, how do we make civilization last a million years? You know, we often get caught up in, like, the day-to-day -day things, but we want to have at least a million-year civilization, if not a hundred million-year civilization, or a billion-year civilization. A absolutely crucial to that goal is becoming a multi-planet species. One might argue that planning the future of civilization for a million years seems rather ambitious, seeing that most of us can't even make a house plant last through the winter. But maybe that's what a trillion dollars do to your brain. As I discussed in an earlier video, Musk's philosophy, like that of many billionaires, seems to be closely aligned with the long-termist movement. Long-termists think that we should be more concerned with the really long-term future of our species rather than the present. Their logic is that if everything goes according to their plan, then the human population will increase exponentially. Therefore, what happens in the future matters much more than what happens now. This philosophy has a big moral issue because it's discounting the suffering of people in the present in exchange for the very uncertain prospect of people flourishing in the future. And it's this moral tension, I think, that you see in the arguments between Musk and people like Rees, who think we'd be better off focusing on the problems that are in our face right now, like climate change. That said, I think Musk has a point. We don't think about the long-term future enough. There are some existential risks that could wipe out pretty much all humans on this planet within a decade or so. This includes big asteroid impacts and supervolcano eruptions that throw enough dust and ash into the atmosphere to kill most plant life. And while we've made some progress with the deflection of asteroids, there's still a long way to go. There's nothing we could do about a supervolcano eruption, and I think my toaster is plotting against me. There's also the issue of risk multipliers, that several disasters in short sequence can add up and lead to extinction. This could be, for example, economic stress from climate change, together with microbial resistance, a nuclear war and a pandemic. And then imagine, in those circumstances, there's an asteroid coming at us. Would we have the resources left to deflect it? I think that's highly questionable. I talked about these existential risks in an earlier episode. And these are all localized planetary problems. So Musk is right that to mitigate existential risks to the human species, it makes sense to put people on another planet. We could put some on the moon, but making the moon habitable is much harder than Mars because it's just too small to keep an atmosphere. And also, as Musk points out, it isn't all that difficult to nuke the moon, at least not if you're Russia. Let's say there's a World War III, a global thermonuclear warfare, 
They'll probably throw a few nukes at, at the moon. <laughs> I love how casually he says this. Just your average Tuesday coffee emails throwing a few nukes at the moon. But yes, populating Mars is a really good plan to mitigate existential risks. It isn't the greatest place to live, but it's near enough and similar enough to Earth to park some people there as genetic backup, basically. Actually, I wouldn't be surprised if Musk will try to get some of his kids to move there. Okay, so these are, I think, all the major points to consider. Terraforming Mars is almost certainly not economically feasible, not within the next several hundred years. Living in habitats? Probably possible if Musk attracts governmental support, though I suspect they'll have a hard time finding sufficiently many volunteers. There are no good economic reasons to do it. For scientific purposes, it'd make more sense to send robots. The major reason to do it is mitigating existential risks for humanity. And to evaluate the latter, we'll have to ask about the opportunity costs. What is it that we won't be able to do if we pour so much resources, money, people, materials into Mars colony? There'll be less left to develop technologies like nuclear fusion, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering or bionics, all of which would make life on Earth better and would also make moving to Mars later dramatically simpler and almost certainly cheaper. Basically, I arrive at the conclusion that moving to Mars is a good idea, but it's too early. I think we should first develop better power sources, better propulsion systems, methods for faster adaptation to new environments, either genetic or biotechnological, and better ways of managing large artificial ecosystems, and then go to Mars. That said, I strongly doubt that Elon is going to give up on his Mars plans. What do you think about this? Let me know in the comments. Whatever you think about going to Mars, I think it's a good idea to take care of this planet, which is why I want to tell you of an amazing bottom-up approach to nature conservation, Planet Wild, that I've been part of for more than a year now. Planet Wild is a community-funded nature protection group. They restore ecosystems and change the world for the better, one mission at a time. Each month, Planet Wild embarks on a new mission, which they document with videos right here on YouTube. Whether it's planting trees, reintroducing animals to forests where they once thrived, or using drones to study blue whales, Planet Wild is making a real difference for nature preservation. For their latest mission, they have teamed up with people in the United States to restore the grass and biodiversity in the Wild West to make it, well, wild again. They're removing fences and protecting and monitoring the animals such as bisons. And you can become part of it. Planet Wild walks the walk where others just talk the talk and you can help them. Visit Planet Wild through the link in the description or scan the QR code to learn more. If you still need some encouragement, I have a special offer. I'll cover the first month of your subscription if you're among the first 200 to sign up using my code. Or go and watch some of their videos on YouTube first to learn more about them. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.